This video is brought to you by Squarespace. From websites and online stores to tools and analytics, Squarespace is the all-in-one platform to build a beautiful presence and run your business. Welcome back everyone. In this video, we're going to talk about composition in photography. I did a video a few weeks ago where we were talking about figure ground relationships. If you haven't seen that, I'll link it below, but we're going to expand on that a little bit in this video. We're doing these little exercises without a camera. We're just using paper objects because the idea here is to understand how to visualize things so then when you are behind the camera, you can learn to start to recognize certain patterns or more importantly, start to recognize certain relationships between things in your scene. I'm using construction paper here just to represent my ground. You could do this in landscape or portrait orientation. It doesn't really matter. In fact, I would try both. Then you need a second color of construction paper. I've cut out some different size circles to get started here. You could do different shapes. I'm keeping things super simple here. I just simply have three different circles that are different sizes. And what we can do is move these around on our ground to kind of recognize recognize relationships between them. So if I do something like this, I imply some kind of line or direction. As soon as I move one of these out, we start to see shapes that are implied. It's the relationships to these, but it's also the relationship to the ground. If I have things more aligned in the middle, we can suggest symmetry. If I have them closer to the edge, they're going to have more dominance and more emphasis, and it has a completely different feel to it. But what I want to bring up with you guys in this video is we have, uh, in the last video, talked about these relationships, but what if the ground actually had a relationship too. So I'm gonna do something very simple here. What if I was just able to tilt the ground, and yes, I very sneakily hid another sheet of paper behind this one, but now all of a sudden I have a dynamic ground, and this has a tremendously powerful impact on the composition as a whole. The same theory of relationships between our objects still apply here, but we have created a second layer of complexity. So for instance, I could still create symmetry with something like this, but I can do it at a diagonal line, and it has a little more interest to it because this has come into play over here. I can also do things like create and maybe imply shape. How does that relate to the new ground? Also, the same thing applies. When you have objects closer to the edge versus the middle, objects closer to the edge are gonna have more weight. Here's another thing that's kind of interesting is I can actually take them off the edge and so they kind of start to disappear and create a complexity of their own. Maybe you don't want to do that with everything, but maybe this one comes into play. So there's a lot of options that we start to have when we start to play with these relationships. Now, how does this relate to photography? I know you're asking. We're just simply moving around paper here and look, oh wow, I have another one underneath. How do you move the ground in photography? Well, you have to imply it. Let me, I've got a perfect example. Okay. So does this look vaguely familiar? It looks exactly like we just did. So this is André Kertesz. This was taken in the 20s. This is a still life of Mondrian, the painter. That's his glasses and pipe. And so what we've done is we have dynamic ground going on here because he's using the table as a secondary ground. This is a really interesting thing because your ground technically is just the image, but to do this dynamic ground, we have to take something in the image to actually make it that secondary ground. And that's when you get your definition. This is such an awesome technique, and Kurtesh wasn't the only one to do this. We're going to look at some other images that do this same thing. But I do want to make it clear, though, because we talked about setting up the ground, and the ground is just inherently the photograph itself, and so how objects play off of that. So to do this dynamic ground, I'm going to repeat this, that you have to have something in the scene that is an object that creates a secondary ground. And this is easier said than done, because what defines an object in the scene? We're dealing with all these examples. You can see that we're dealing with very high contrasts, and so the difference between this and the real world is the real world you don't always have this high a contrast but that's one thing as a photographer you want to be able to strive for because we've all done it where you take an image let's say it's a portrait of somebody and they're on a background that's too busy or it's too close in color to maybe skin tones or something like that and it just doesn't stand out and pop like you want it to and so a typical crutch that photographers love to use is use a really shallow depth of field so crank that down try and blur it out but I would argue that you're still gonna have less effect than you would if you're actually able to create contrast and that's where lighting and a lot of other concepts come into mind. What we've done in this video is we've transposed everything to borrow a musical term. Now we did this at an angle and you're definitely going to start to create three-dimensional kind of feel to this but you could also do it on a much simpler level. What if I just extended my ground out like this and what if my you know, my composition was more over in this area. Well, maybe what this does is it creates balance because we have a secondary ground, we have composition over here. I know these are just kind of two different colors, but if you had more, you might be able to actually overlap. And again, I think you could probably get enough of a separation with the shadow here, but then you start to see how this 
border of the ground or this line that's implied at the edge here can start to create a secondary symmetry. We still have all this composition left over here, then why is this interesting? It's off axis, but it lines up, but that secondary ground or having two grounds is what enables us to do that. So there's a lot you can do. I do wanna show you some more examples of this, and this is a really great technique when you can get it down. And the people who have been masters of this, just their compositions have a complexity to them that's just amazing. So I wanna get into that, but I also want to mention too that that with all this awesome work that you guys are doing, you're gonna be wanting to put a website together and you should check out our sponsor today who are the awesome folks over at squarespace.com. Squarespace is the easiest way to build a website, photo gallery, or online store without having to write a single line of code. Start with one of their gorgeous templates, use their drag and drop interface, build your brand online, but Squarespace is way more than just a way to build a website. Squarespace provides an amazing set of tools to create revenue and run a business. Squarespace now now features dedicated member areas, allowing you to connect with your audience and generate revenue through members only content. You can manage members, you can send them email communications, and you can leverage audience insights. Building an e-commerce site couldn't be any easier, and Squarespace now also supports collecting donations. So you can get support for a cause or charity by gathering contributions with PayPal, Apple Pay, Stripe, and Venmo, and build your audience using social sharing. The Squarespace blogging platform has a sharing button that you can customize that's going to allow sharing on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, StumbleUpon, Reddit, Pinterest, and Tumblr. So head over to Squarespace for a free trial. Once you feel that Squarespace is right for you, I can save you an additional 10% on your first order by using offer code AOP on checkout or just use the link below this video. Once again, that offer code is AOP and I wanna give a special shout out and thanks to the awesome folks at Squarespace for sponsoring this video. So one thing that you're gonna hear me repeat a lot when we talk about composition is this idea of photography being a subtractive process. So let's compare this to something like painting where you take a brush and paints and you're actually painting on a canvas. You're creating the entire composition with the tool of choice that you're using and that's how it comes together. With photography, you have things in front of you and cropping, whether it's in camera or preferably or post-production, that's of the essence because it's what you decide not to include the photograph. If you just walk out with a camera and grab a scene, there is just chaos. There's no order to it. There's no organization to it. There's no composition. And that's what we do where that comes into play. And so you're going to hear me talk about the subtractive idea a lot. I want to give you a couple other examples of some amazing photographers who use this figure ground relationship and a secondary ground to a great effect. So one of my favorites, I've talked about this a million times, is the great Arnold Newman portrait of Stravinsky. This is one of my favorite photographs ever. There's a lot going on in this. One of the things that's very subtle in this picture is the way we have our ground divided in the background and where it's divided. How is that divided? It's just a wall and it's the light and the way it hits it. It's just contrast. And that is such a key element to this photograph in bringing it all together. If that were not there, this would probably look like a much different photograph. It brings a little bit of unity to it. It brings some symmetry to it. This image is actually cropped in post-production. If you've ever seen the original, it's a four by five transparency. It exists, I'll show it to you here, and you can see the crop marks that Newman put on it. So he decided what he wanted to crop out. He's working with a massively large negative, so he had space to do it for a final print, and that's what he did. But you can see where those decisions were made and what the thinking was behind it. It's a very subtle thing, but remember contrast is a big part of all of this. Contrast is what gives you definition. It can also, the lack of contrast, give you a subtle thing, and that's what he was able to do here. If that was a hard black and white in terms of the two colors of each wall, it would have a completely different effect too and it probably would be overkill. Another photographer who was exceptionally good at this idea of working with the ground as part of a composition was Irving Penn. He did this in a number of ways. So Irving Penn was the master. He shot for a lot of fashion magazines so he did a lot of celebrity portraits, a lot of fashion work, he even did still lives, product shots. Incredible photographer. One of the things that he did in his studio is he set up this corner which was less than a 45 degree angle. It was really tight. It was two walls that sit together and he would put celebrities and fashion models and all kinds of people into this corner and he did what are known today as the corner portraits and so these were all in studio and this sort of in a way not only manipulates the composition visually but does something that is quite magical in that it breaks down the fourth wall and so the idea of okay well how do objects in the scene relate to one another how do things in your picture relate to one another but how does the sitter relate to the camera or the background or whatever it is and so a lot of people look very uncomfortable in these corner portraits such as this one of Marcel Duchamp 
Other people look very natural. There's Stravinsky again. There's several that are just amazing. And it's really interesting because there's a psychological element that comes in these photographs by putting two things together that do not really go together, like cramming a person into a corner, so to speak. But it, the picture becomes the way that person is responding to that environment. And of course, Penn would take breaking the fourth wall a step further and actually move the camera back. And rather than crop out parts of the set, he'd leave them in the image a lot of times, which I think give this a really interesting juxtaposition, especially when you're shooting high-end fashion, you're shooting celebrities, and all of a sudden you can see the edge of the set or you can see the end of the background paper. It breaks that fourth wall, and a lot of times this is referred to as deconstruction within the photograph. It's a really cool technique and it probably happened by accident, but it gives everything a much more organic quality to it that I think is really important to have in photography a lot of times. So what are your next steps? What is your assignment in all of this, so to speak? Well, first of all, if you haven't seen that first video, please go back and watch it because it really covers a lot of the basics and it covers this little exercise that we're doing on paper that I think is really important to do. A lot of people would leave comments on there. I knew this would happen. Well, oh, I did this on the computer. It's really easy. Yeah, but but when you're working on a computer, it's not tactile. You're not moving things with your hands. And I think when you get into photography, you're not manipulating with a, a computer. You have the abstraction of a camera being between you and your subject, and you're trying to make sense of that. So I think it's important to get the tactile element of this. I know only a few people do it, but that's life anyway. But anyway, that's the first thing I would do. The second thing I would do is go look at work. I've given you some examples of some photographers that you can start with. But when you look at pictures, try to start to learn to see these things. What are the relationships? relationships between objects in the scene? What are their relationships to the ground? And is there some kind of dynamic ground going on in there? I talked about transposition, borrowing that term from music, and there's a ton of great examples. But if you think of great compositions in music where you have a musical theme and later you hear that transposed into something else or presented in a different way, that's what you're able to do by moving that ground. And I think it's a really interesting technique. It's something to start looking for in compositions. And then finally, you need to go make photographs. And this is something that I want to explore in the videos and I'm still moving into the studio. It's just the move that never ends. But that's an additional video type that I want to make in this series is actually putting this stuff into practice and how do we make that work in reality. But go take pictures. Go see if you can employ some of these techniques. What have you learned? What have you learned how to see? And what can you take and bring into your own work? What you're going to have to realize is you're going to have to be very patient. You're going to have to slow down and you're going to have to think about things a little bit. And if you don't get any photographs the first time, that's great. If you get a bunch of stuff you don't like, that's great because you're going to learn from that and you're going to build on that as you move forward. The second time, maybe you get one photograph that's interesting that brings some of these things together. Maybe these techniques actually spur a new idea for you. This is what you want to be looking for and this is all about progress and getting better as a photographer. Anyway, more videos to come. If you have any questions, drop them below. I'll see you guys in the next one. Until then, later.